this might be the largest crowd I've ever had to present to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I cobbled this together at the last minute, so I'm a bit wobbly. Please forgive me. Uh, so my name is Grant Hinner. I'm the Program Coordinator for Climate Change Adaptation at Spirit Nursery Council. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yep, so like I said, I'm originally from Queensland. Um, born down in Brisbane, but I grew up by way of uh, a whole number of different places. It was interesting that you put up earlier some discussion around mining. Uh, my old man and his old man have been involved in mining their whole careers, and because of that I've lived in um, the Wheat Belt, uh, Nullumboy, Sierra Leone, Borneo a couple of times, and travelled around a whole lot. Uh, I did an environmental management and sustainable development degree um, down at UQ. And in fact, I think it was my childhood that pushed me towards the environment. Um, a couple combinations, um, learning through things like the BBC production, um, productions by David Attenborough, Steve Irwin, Jack Hanna, that kind of thing. Things like Totally Wild, Captain <laughs> Planet, um, which I think play a really important role, um, get them while they're young. And uh, also in my personal life, uh, I was exposed to all this amazing environmental discussion and then seeing in my personal life, um, so no other way to put it, the Borneo jungle being blown up for a gold mine. Um, so I think I can thank my dad for pushing me in an environmental direction. <laughs> yeah, so my degree was more about um, working in the corporate social responsibility space. Um, and my thinking back then was that's where you make real change, at the big blue chip companies. Uh, and so, but all along when it comes to sustainability, I've always been, it's not that I don't care about social issues, but more about the environment. So conservation, pollution, and in more recent times, climate change. Um, and so I realized that the corporate space wasn't really doing it for me. I was essentially just pulling together performance reports to submit to investors or to the Commonwealth. And it was pretty hard to see how I was doing world-saving work by sitting in a fancy uh, high-rise building in the Sydney CBD. And so for year, for the last couple of years, my partner and I have decided um, that we want to relocate back to southeast Queensland to be closer to family and friends. Um, and the ideal situation would be somewhere around here. Um, my parents live out at Kinkin, grandparents at Belli Park, at Calandra, and various friends spread out throughout the coast. And last year, um, during our engagement year, when I was in the depths of my corporate despair, um, we said, Gosh, the, the perfect scenario would be to be working in Noosa um, on something to do with pollution or climate change, preferably at the council, because then you, you're operating at a local level where you can actually see the, the product of your efforts. And then uh, towards the end of our honeymoon in November uh, 2016, um, while we were discussing how we ran out of duty-free gin so quickly, um, <laughs> She got one of those job alert emails from seek.com that said that there was a climate change adaptation role going at Noosa Council. <laughs> and uh, she very promptly threw the phone in my lap and said, if you don't do everything you can to get this job, I'm going to divorce you straight away. <laughs> so here I am. Yep. Still married. <clears throat> so yeah, so cut forward to now. I'm working on my dream job at the moment. Uh, I'm a generalist, project manager, I'm definitely no ecologist. Um, I get to play in the community engagement space, learn stuff about engineering, economics, environment, um, and of course the climate space. Uh, so I'm fortunate that I don't have to be an expert in any one of these topics and surrounded by experts or subject matter experts at council as well as, as I'm quickly learning out in the community, there's a lot of um, subject experts out here. Um, my father-in-law is actually the former president of the American Meteorological Society, so I'm always pestering him with questions around uh, the latest climate projections whenever he comes here or I go to Colorado. I'm oh, sorry, my wife's from Colorado. Alright, next slide. Oh, it worked. Success. Yay! 
Um, so before I get stuck in, just in case it wasn't clear, the work that I'm doing is on climate change adaptation. Um, Annie Nolan, some of you may already be aware of her, is working in the mitigation space at Council, but uh, Annie and I catch up quite regularly just to swap notes on where each of our work is up to date, and um, we've already got a mind to try to take advantage of any opportunities to, um, I guess, achieve outcomes with both projects, uh, sorry, through one action, achieve outcomes for both projects, because um, there are some adaptation measures that are also mitigation measures, and vice versa. So, why are we doing this? Although the climatic impacts are not projected to occur for some time, uh, it's critical that Council takes a proactive and informed action regarding climate change to improve its own, the communities, as well as to ensure the natural values, which Noosa is known for, are ready for whatever happens. So we want to be proactive. We want to ensure Council and community are able to meet, to both meet the challenges posed, but also to take advantage of any other opportunities as they arise. One of the key messages of this work that we're doing is we don't want to create a sense of alarm. It's just more about being informed, not alarmed. So butcher the be alert, not alarmed slogan. Um, and we have sufficient time to plan action. So it's important to do this work now, even though the problem seems like it's way off in the future. Um, Council believes it has a duty of care in ensuring that there's a legacy for future councils as well as future members of the community that we do this work today. So for us, it's about uh, good governance and proactive risk management, as I've already said. Um, there are a number of different imperatives for council. I won't go through all of them, but there's economic ones such as um, costly damage to council assets and infrastructure that's important to maintaining standards of service for the community. Uh, if we're, for example, if we, well, as expected, we experience more extreme heat days and longer droughts. That has an impact on the integrity of the road surface, which requires the road to be repaired more often, which means council has to put more budget towards that, and that money has to come from somewhere. Um, this ecological imperatives, um, damage to local biodiversity values, um, and social imperatives. Um, one, of the, one of the main ones is the threats to physical health and safety of the community. And I don't just mean through things like Cyclones, um, big, the big killer is actually heat, heat related stress. Um, and as we know, there are forecast to be more and more frequent heat waves, so that's something we need to be across. From Council's own perspective, there are a number of different risks um, in a couple, couple areas. Um, one of the ones that right now the, the least is known about is litigation and legal liability in terms of. Um, obtaining the right information and um, converting that information or embedding that information into appropriate planning and procedural responses and making sure that information is available. So that one, that sort of area of climate, climate change adaptation is still in its infancy. Um, there's also reputational risks and financial sustainability risks, like I said, with the road, there's all these, all these potential increased costs that council will have to be aware of. And there's also, um, ensuring we satisfy community expectations. So I definitely won't read through all of those, but I think I've covered off on most of them already. It's really the outcomes we're after with this work that we're doing is around ensuring that we have, we, the council and the community and, the, and all the other um, stakeholders out there have the best information available in terms of the risks climate change poses to Noosa. Um, it's about ensuring that there's timely integration into business as usual risk management processes and other government systems. <clears throat> it's about long-term financial planning for potential higher costs associated with climate change. Um, and the flip side of that is ensuring we avoid any unplanned reactionary costs along the way. This work aligns with Council's stated sustainability principles. Um, just rattling off a few there. Resources managed sustainably, uh, sustainably, making sure the economy stays prosperous with regard to the environment, um, that the community is connected and resilient. And that might sound a bit strange in terms of 
the thinking that went into these, but thinking of that in terms of ensuring, say, the road network is still functional during a future um, climate-related hazard, and ensuring that the, the places that we all love and enjoy today, and many people have fought quite hard to protect, uh, are, are available to future generations to enjoy it themselves. So the way the relationship between local government and state government works differs across the country. From a climate change adaptation perspective, um, in Queensland this means a lot of the responsibility for on-ground action falls to local government. Um, but as we were discussing earlier on, as we learned with the previous LNP administration, what, go on, what goes on at the state level can still have quite a big impact on what's possible at the local level. So putting together uh, putting politics aside, it was reassuring from an adaptation perspective to see some continuity at the state level with the results of the recent state election. Um, for those not already aware, last year in July, the state government released uh, its, two, its twin strategies on climate change action for Queensland. So there was one around um, uh, mitigation, emissions reduction, although it's not Called that, it's called transitioning to a clean economy, I think it's called. Um, what's that? The pathway. Yeah, the pathways, that's it, pathways to a clean economy. And uh, the other one is the Queensland Climate Adaptation Strategy, which is the one that uh, uh, relates directly to the work that I'm involved in. Don't be, I'm sure none of you are surprised by the lack of detail on some of those documents, but I think it's at least a start and we're generally heading in the right direction. Um, there is more to come. In fact, this year they've really ramped up the amount of ramped up the amount of funding available to adaptation. And there's a couple of things in the work in the works for putting together adaptation plans on a sector by sector basis. So this isn't um, something that council councils necessarily to decide to do on their own. Um, there is actually an impetus for doing this work in the um, in state planning policy that was released in, also in July last year. So council has statutory obligations in terms of land use planning and preparing land uh, preparing planning schemes and development assessment um, criteria that uh, take into account natural hazards. And so there's specific um, items in there to do with erosion, storm tide, and a few other um, things related to natural hazards. <clears throat> it also mandates that a risk assessment be undertaken and that these incomes inform the planning scheme, which fortunately for news of these two projects are going on at the same time. Um, and it's also looking for a risk-based approach to land use planning, so I'll, I'll get stuck into how we're incorporating that into this project later on. <coughs> Um, but from the SPP's point of view, it's really critical that it's not just done on an opinion-based approach, that uh, there is actually science behind why um, things that end up in a planning scheme uh, do. I'll just look through some of these. I won't go into those just because they're a little bit more detail later on. <clears throat> so I'll go into more detail in a short while on the coastal hazards adaptation plan that we're working on. Um, but suffice to say that a lot of the SPP um, material that relates to natural hazards for Queensland relates quite strongly to um, riverine flooding and then also coastal hazards like storm tide inundation, coastal erosion, shoreline recession, and permanent inundation from sea level rise. <clears throat> but the project we're working on is not just all about the environment, as some people have raised some concerns, oh, sorry, not just all about the built environment. Uh, people have raised concerns that um, projects such as these tend to leave the environment to the side and just focus on um, commercial premises, roads, infrastructure, private, the private sector. Um, this particular project, um, before I arrived, when council sought funding from the state government to undertake the coastal hazards adaptation plan, um, the team working on that application worked very, very hard to get 
extra funding to undertake specific work to do with local biodiversity. Um, and in fact, at a recent conference up in Townsville as part of this um, project, and all the councils who are thinking about doing it, the councils who are doing it were there. Um, after the presentation I gave on where we're at, a few of them came up to me afterwards and said, we wish we were in a position to do more work looking at the environment because they were already starting to get feedback that that's what they should be doing. So um, kudos to the people at council who had the foresight to push for that and didn't give up because there was quite a lot of pushback from the Q and HP on that run. Um, this piece of work won't just be a standalone. It's going to have quite a big influence on a lot of other things that happen in council and out in the community. Um, there's various plans uh, either in the works or to be updated in the future at council that will be influenced by this. So the river plan that um, people like Peter Milne and Jan Madden are some, uh, currently working on will be influenced by this. Um, bush management plans, um, of course the planning scheme, disaster management planning to a certain extent in terms of um, availability of resources and uh, emergency procedures. So uh, disaster management planning tends to have a lot shorter looking time horizon that they plan towards. Uh, and of course, asset planning is, um, sorry, I'm not saying things, um, asset planning and maintenance programs as well. So I'd like to just cover off quickly on how the climate change is changing, and I know a lot of you are probably already aware of this, um, but I just want to talk about it mostly in terms of Noosa. <clears throat> so the climate's never static, and obviously the problem this time around is the, is the rate of change that the climate is changing at, and rather scarily at what is expected to be an accelerating rate of change. Unfortunately, adapting to changes to the Earth's climate ecologically or um, anthropologically don't happen overnight. They take a lot of planning involved. In Australia, for instance, we can already see that there's already been around about one degree Celsius of temperature rise in the last century. And in fact, globally mean sea levels have risen around about 20 centimetres since the late 1800s. And the uh, speed of sea level rise is expected to increase as the century goes on. So this yeah. This image here is taken from the state government's QCAS strategy. Um, so you can look for that, look at that yourself. And in fact, I encourage you to have a quick look at it just so you know what the, where the state's thinking is at, if you haven't already. Um, there are a couple, uh, as I said earlier, um, sectors where they are only just now in the inception planning phase for how to put together adaptation plans for those. So um, it's a good idea to um, see where you can have your say. Um, I'll leave the ability to have a say with the state side. Um, <clears throat> so we're expecting to see hotter, hotter, more hot days. Um, we're already seeing the number of hot days has doubled over the last um, 50 years. And in fact, the minimum levels experienced in winter have actually increased. So it's not that we're not getting cold temperatures anymore, it's just that the floor in winter is coming up. Um, we've seen, uh, as far as cyclones go, it's a little bit more uncertain exactly what's going to happen um, in terms of frequency. But what we do know is that they will become more intense and the probability that they may reach further south is certainly going to increase just by um, nature of pure physics is more energy in the system and uh, sea surface temperatures, warm sea surface temperatures are extending further south. Um, and as you can see, Noosa has, or our part of the world, has experienced tropical cyclones in the past. Though maybe it's been a while since that's happened and so maybe we need to think a, bit, a little bit more about that. So a lot's changed in Noosa at, in the last 40 years, or even, even longer than that, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, so it's probably no surprise to a lot of people in this room that their development has gone on where there used to be no development. So I think I put dates on these, but I believe this image here is from the late 70s, early 80s. And sorry, these two images. And then this image here is from 2010. So you can already see a lot of development along Hastings Street, this big area right here. So, so there's a question now, has this development occurred 
without taking into account the kind of coastal hazards that can be experienced here in New South. I won't answer that on the other people. So here's another quick example here. Uh, how quickly the coastline has changed. We've got a very natural dynamic system here. And here we're very starting to see development that starts to impose itself on natural on the natural system. Along there, there we go, it's the same image from before. <clears throat> Just in the space of about 10 years. So if you haven't seen them already, the CSIRO Road has got a separate standalone website called Climate Analogs, where you can go in and put in any location in the country, and it's based on climate change projections, it'll tell you where there currently exists somewhere else in the country with the climate that the, the location you've picked may resemble in the future. So for Noosa, so far the projections say that by mid-century we'll, our climate may be more like Proserpine. And by the end of the century, uh, a lot more like Nullamboy up around Darwin. So if you compare those two places to how things look on the ground here, whether that's in, in, in the kinds of flora and fauna and um, uh, habitat types that we see, or building types and building patterns, and then compare that to what currently exists in those other two locations, um, maybe there's some questions there that we need, might need to be asking ourselves in terms of are we prepared? So what? So what if the climate changes? The climate's always changed. Um, I like to say, forget about Uber, forget about Instagram, forget about artificial intelligence. Climate change is the great disruptor. Um, it's an amplifier of existing risks. So, for instance, we already get cyclones here, storm tides. But how is it going to make them worse? Will it make them worse? Um, and it can also work to erode the underlying resilience of a system or an asset today so that it's less capable of um, coping with a future, future hazard. <clears throat> this um, particular infographic is from the Coast Adapt website. So I think I had the logo up at the start. Um, Coast Adapt is a platform pulled together by NCAR, which is the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, which was a Commonwealth-funded um, group based out of Griffith University. Um, they've put together what I believe is the most comprehensive and easy to understand resource in the world in terms of what climate change means for a local level, particularly in Australia. It's all geared towards local government, local communities in Australia, and they have some amazing resources in there. Um, if you're very technically minded, there's a wealth of academic papers that you can bury your head in for years, uh, but there's also some really, really easy to understand uh, material for people who just want to get the basics and then move on. Um, so enough about plugging them. Um, so, so what does all this mean? So I just hinted out before that with the change of climate, it may exacerbate existing hazards and risks that already um, exist. So one of the things we've been looking at the last year is how does sea level rise, um, how might sea level rise in a warming ocean mean for some of the coastal hazards we face here in Noosa, namely shoreline erosion and storm tides. So we have a history of coastal hazards here in Noosa. Um, we've seen what a cyclone that comes very, very close can do. Um, we've seen, I believe this is the impact of Cyclone Hamish back in 2009. So it didn't hit directly, but it got pretty close and what big swells can do. And these, uh, I think that's actually from 1992. I'm not sure why it's a black and white photo. And this is from the 50s. I think it was Cyclone Dina, Dina, the I-N-A-H. And uh, so you can see right there how, how um, even then already measures were being put in to protect or attempt to protect uh, coastal planting assets. But if you haven't lived here for a long time, some of these might be a surprise. And we all know that Noosa has um, quite a lot of uh, population turnover, a lot of people who have moved up maybe in the last 10, 20 years from other parts of um, the country where, uh, unlike Queensland, they don't ex ex experience the, the range and the severity of um, natural hazards that Queensland gets. And so some of this stuff, when it happens again, might be quite a shock to people. 
So as I hinted at, this um, graphic from the Union of Concerned Scientists um, does an excellent job at explaining um, what sea level rise means specifically from, say, a storm tide perspective. So if the sea level rises, um, what, what you see is an elevation of the floor of where a storm tide starts. So meaning today, a one in 100 year storm tide event may only go, say, just pulling a number out of it, out of my pocket, 100 metres. But if the sea level rises a metre, that 100 metres might actually turn into, say, 150 or 200 metres. It all depends on the topography and the, the lay of the land, wherever it's going on. And so often um, we've, we've put development where future storm tide inundation may be expected to occur. <clears throat> so this is just a little explainer on what a storm tide is. So a lot of you are probably familiar with the word storm surge, but storm surge is only part of what goes on. So when you have a tropical cyclone or, or a low pressure system come in, you know, that low pressure elevates the level of the ocean. And then you have onshore winds that also continue to elevate and push the water up towards the coastline. I don't know if you saw when Hurricane Harvey, I think it was, hit Florida, down in Cuba, they experienced, um, there were bays that were drained of water. So as water gets pushed towards Florida, it's coming from somewhere else. And so when that coincides with um, a tide, that's called a storm tide. Um, the severity of a storm tide can really depend on where in the tide cycle that event occurs. Um, I recently saw a presentation by um, Queensland's foremost expert in storm tides, um, Dr. Bruce Harper. Um, where he explained there was an event uh, where a cyclone came <clears throat> very close to uh, somewhere in central Queensland where just by sheer, sheer luck the storm surge peaked um, during the lowest point in the tide cycle and when we saw photos of the damage that occurred in fact I think I've got some images yeah um, this is one image from I think that is actually uh, Bowen somewhere near there um that's that event so that was they had the best case scenario where they had a low tide at the same time so you can see how much damage that's caused um now imagine if they had their normal high tide which is about a meter and a half two meters higher than that and how bad that would have been so the other thing we've been focusing on uh, this past year is coastal erosion so um, it's probably no surprise to a lot of people here how that functions. You have a storm event, the waves come in, they scrape away a whole bunch of sediment, and you've got uh, a short term erosion event. But once you start to take into account uh, sea level rise, how much sediment gets eroded, how far in it goes, increases as the sea level increases. And on top of that, you also get just a natural um, tendency for the shoreline to want to uh, recede landward or landward of its current position. <clears throat> so, obviously, a lot of the East Coast, in fact, a lot of Australia, is our sand based coastal systems. So, when left to their own devices, um, you naturally see um, how those landforms um, are shaped and changed. For instance, you might see a room mouth. Remember a room mouth being in one location when you were young, and now it's moved 100 metres north or south. And your great grandchildren might come along and see that it's gone back to where you used to see it and have no idea that it was sitting somewhere else. Where it gets tricky is where development has occurred and those natural processes are no longer capable of functioning correctly. Um, this is an image from 2016. I'm, I imagine a lot of people here have seen us already. Um, of a particular stretch of Coleroy Beach, which, funnily enough, is actually where I was living before I came to Noosa. I lived 100 metres straight up that street and uh, we actually went to the US on a holiday and we'd been trying to get into one of these apartments, sorry, not used to a point up, one of these apartments up the top here, came back uh, an hour after our flight landed in the airport, they shut Sydney airport because the storm, that's when the storm was really ramping up and a day later we woke to all of this and police everywhere and people couldn't get back into these people couldn't get back into their houses for the better part of a year um here's another image of main beach during an erosion event uh quote unquote dog beach which is a good example of where a project like this gets a little bit tricky because this is a controversial 
um, piece of land in Noosa. I can't remember where this group stands on that, but um, <laughs> suffice to say, we've got members of the community who love it and think it should be repaired and protected, and others who say that nature take its course. So I'll leave that discussion for another day. And this is an image that our consultants who are doing uh, the climate modelling and the engineering component of this project have um, took for some work they did down in Coffs Harbour. <clears throat> so in terms of responding to climate change risks, um, as I said earlier, Mr Council is not going it alone. In fact, um, Queensland's um, one of the late comers to this kind of work. Uh, in South Australia, they've had it, they've been working on this for a better part of the last five to 10 years. Um, Southwest WA is quite advanced in this. Parts of Victoria are quite advanced in this. Um, Queensland uh, is a little bit late to the party, though thankfully we're ahead of New South Wales. Um, worldwide, uh, there are places that have got it much worse than we do. Um, Florida is already experiencing, has been experiencing for quite some time, the effects of sea level rise. Uh, in fact, the mayor and the chief resilience officer from the city of Miami was on the Gold Coast last year giving a presentation explaining how uh, every single day uh, there are air suburbs where the seawater comes up through the drainage systems and people are walking through an inch, two, three inches of salt water in their front yards, coming up to their letterboxes and their front door in some cases. So I think that's a really good lesson to learn around acting early and because they are facing having to spend a huge amount of money to deal with the problem. Um, it's not just forward thinking organisations or I guess what some people might call greeny organisations. You've got the US Department of Defence has been taking this serious for a very long time. Um, they are having to deal with these issues right on the front line. I, I think it was Four Corners ran a program last year uh, where they um, covered up on how the US Navy is dealing with this. Um, and of course, the big end of town, the big insurers and the reinsurers, um, like Swiss Re and Munich Re, have been looking at this for 10, 15 years. In fact, they've had some of the best science available to them on how it may affect their business. And of course, the investment sector. Um, there's a number of different groups, um, Investor Group on Climate Change, um, the, uh, the Task Force on Climate, um, climate Financial Disclosure Project, um, there's a the UN PRI, um, a, a lot of big companies are involved in those, you've got um, BlackRock, the world's largest investment group, Vanguard, um, Unilever, BHP is sort of coming to the party. Um, and more locally, Colonial First State, Lendlease, um, QIC are all party to these organisations. Um, they might not be getting it right right now, but it's comforting to see that the big end of town is now moving in the right direction. Where am I? Oh, wow. I'm dragging on. So we're doing so far. So this isn't the first time, first piece of work that um, Council or NUSA have been doing on climate change adaptation. There was the Climate Action Plan pulled together by the Biosphere and SCQ catchments back in 2012, supported by a raft of other groups. Um, <clears throat> it covered off on a range of focus areas like health, the economy, agriculture, and came up with 33 actions that could be done. Um, many of these actions are the kind of things that Council is trying to get answers for today, and they, a lot of them revolve around um, getting more information, educating the community, um, uh, trying to figure out how we can respond and also trying to figure out who's responsible for what um, because not everything to do with adaptation is up to council or the state or the commonwealth or the individual is shared responsibility right across the board. Um, the current lucid plan, luckily there's been foresight at council in the past to maintain um, some of the natural systems that also play a hazard mitigation role. So the best example being the huge foreshore buffer along the eastern beaches, um, as you saw with Colorado and other parts of the country where the development has been allowed to go right up to where the high tide mark goes. They're now potentially wishing that they didn't allow that. And so we, we are very fortunate that those buffers are there in place, uh, but they don't exist all across the Shire, either in an open coast environment or along the river. So that's something that this project is trying to unpack 
where we may our problem areas possibly be in the future. <coughs> We've also been involved, we're actually involved in the final testing of the Coast Adapt a tool uh, in early 2017. Um, we're also participating in the Queensland Government's um, Department of what's called now, Environment and Sciences other climate adaptation initiative called Climate Resilient Councils, which is uh, a, a, a small initiative available to all councils across, across Queensland. It's basically an information session for um, councillors and leadership teams to get across a whole range of different issues associated with climate change, whether it's legal liability, financial sustainability, that kind of thing. Um, we had them in uh, around mid last year and they came in to talk mostly about um, the, the legal side of things, um, financial insurance and governance as well. Um, <clears throat> we also, Council recently ratified uh, its first climate change response policy. So the purpose of this policy was to um, formally acknowledge the scientific consensus around um, climate change science um, and also set out um, two sources of truth to be used going forward rather than because there's quite a few different bodies out there that have if you've ever read climate change prediction projections they can differ quite widely it doesn't necessarily specify how it's meant to be implemented at the departmental or branch level it's just more about sending uh, a, a defensible science-based um, foundation for, for council to take action on um, it has provisions in there to make sure that council is always trying to stay on top of the latest climate science and it seeks to try to wrap together um, mission reduction and adaptation into one policy it doesn't supersede the carbon reduction policy that's already in place um, it basically acknowledges that there's overlap between the two and that they should be working in unison so this is where we're at today so how are we doing it um, council is we're developing a climate change adaptation plan so where the um, state and LGAQ get involved is they've put together a program called um, QCOS 2100 which came out of the findings of the 2010-11 uh, flood inquiry that particular program is um, $12 million available for coastal councils in Queensland to undertake um, a coastal hazards adaptation strategy, although we're calling it a plan, um, specifically looking at um, what's in store from a storm tide, erosion, and permanent inundation from sea level rise perspective. Um, on top of that, this council is seeking to do a broader climate change adaptation plan that looks at a whole raft of other um, climate related risks. So this could be to do with rainfall, drought, humidity, species migration. Um, one of the questions we sometimes get is what's going to happen with crocodiles and irukandji? Um, don't know is the answer. Um, Vector-borne diseases, so increased prevalence of things like dengue and a few other tropical diseases that don't currently come south on a regular basis. <clears throat> And in 2017, this has been our primary focus, but now this year is when we've expanded to start to figure out how do we address what, um, how do we unpack what this might look like and how do we address them going forward. So the QCOS project specifically, but this also applies to both, is um, from the government's perspective set up like this. So it's a two year project. Um, we're currently around about here, floating around in this zone. Um, we've got the control group which is made up of the mayor, two other councillors, um, and then all of the directors from across council. We've also got uh, project working groups that are have been set up to inform various components of the project. So these are, for one of a better term, I guess the mid-level managers at council, but also stakeholders from outside of the community. So with the high level working group, we've got um, people from the environment, economic and social sector involved in that. So these are, this is the QCoast um, program in a nutshell. There's eight phases. So this council, along with Whitsunday Council and Morton Bay Council, were the first to receive funding and applied for funding for all eight phases of the project. Um, I think at last count there are 17 councils that have received some form of funding under this scheme. Uh, most of those aren't doing um, all eight phases. Some of them have done work in this space a little bit before, so they're looking to update 
Sorry. They're looking to uh, update um, various pieces of work they've done. Uh, Sunshine Coast Council, I believe, is only doing phases one to two, I think, or one to three, um, at their own pace. Uh, I'll leave it there. So the first phase is developing a life and project engagement plan. So this is just covering off on what are the kind of things we want to get out of this from an engagement perspective. So some of the really obvious ones, just building awareness of what we're doing, the importance of Noosa, um, how people can be involved, um, how we're going to empower stakeholders within council and outside of council to um, help set the direction for this work. Um, <clears throat> as well as understanding and a really important piece that we're about to get stuck into over the next few months is understanding uh, the community's values in terms of certain assets across the Shire, whether it's uh, a biological asset or a park or a beach or a building or your house, whatever it is, we need to know what the community values specifically within the hazard areas. Um, and what the tolerances are for the risks. So, for example, you might have two, two different assets that are in the exact same location beside each other, um, and they both get um, allocated a medium level of risk, but one of those assets is incredibly important to the community more broadly, and so that means that asset has a lower tolerance for that hazard in particular. So, let's say the cutoff might be we would only address high risks, but in that instance, we'd have to make an exception because it's just unacceptable that that particular thing is impacted. So that's what this whole piece is about trying to unpack. So the second phase, which ran through the middle of last year, was just a scoping study, which is just a review of the existing information as it relates to Noosa, uh, identifying any knowledge gaps, um, looking at limitations of previous state mapping. So these maps have actually been out for quite a while. So the state did its own storm tide and erosion mapping uh, about five years ago now. So what we're looking at here is erosion prone areas. So they did a very, um, it's a good good first pass, uh, first pass attempt at it. And in fact, what QCO's project is all about is trying to make sure that each council is able to develop locally relevant, locally specific, more detailed mapping to use for planning purposes. <clears throat> they also did it for uh, storm tide inundation. And so, like I said, what we found was that's a good first pass, but it was limited um, in detail, but also in scope. It was only looking at the year 2100, and it's a bit hard to know what you've got to do between 2018 and 2100 if you don't know what's happening in the middle and when it's happening. <clears throat> so phase three was um, a really big piece of work. That was the future coastal hazards modeling. So the consultants, BMT Global, um, I can flip back to the logos at the beginning if you want to get those names. Um, modeled for us, we asked them to model uh, what storm tide and erosion may look like uh, at 2040, 2070, and 2100. So 2040, um, for the quick math people, that's only 22 years away, so that's not that far. Uh, it also coincides pretty well with when the new planning scheme that's in development now, uh, its own planning horizon. So. If we get to 2040 and realise we need to change change strategy, there's a perfect opportunity there to gain to align those two pieces of work. So it was looking at um, what the impact of sea level rise of 0.8 of a metre would have. So that's the level that the state government is using. Um, and so we are sort of compelled to go with what the state's doing. It's It's a bit hard, more difficult to go out on a branch and pick a different sea level rise because you're potentially opening yourself up to legal issues. Um, and we also looked at the joint probability of what would happen if we had riverine flooding at the same time as a storm tide event. So um, it seems really obvious you'd think if a cyclone's coming in, brings a whole lot of rain, we're going to get floods, storm tide all at the same time. Um, but historically is very weak data to prove that sort of relationship exists. Often there's a bit of a lag in between the two. Um, and so we, we modeled what that probability would look like, but found it's quite a weak signal. NERSA is um, in many ways unique, and from a flooding perspective, it's unique as well. We've got very steep 
parts of the capsule right up the back and then it just goes into a massive sand based floodplain with big beautiful detention basin basins in the form of the lakes and so um, flooding flood water behaves very differently here to adult to how it might in say somewhere like the sunshine coast or other parts of the country um, short version of that is um, flooding is less severe in Noosa um, thanks to the lay of the land and also the lack of development um, across that land. So what these maps are essentially trying to do is, oh sorry, I thought I could forward, um, is establish where our risks might be. So just for reference, this is the new storm tide at 2100 map, um, the permanent inundation from sea level rise. And this is what the river flood study done uh, in 2016 unpacked from a lower captain perspective. So it might be a bit hard to see for everybody, um, but one of the outcomes we found as part of this phase of the project is that as far as inside the river goes, the dominant hazard is riverine flooding. So flooding associated with rainfall in the catchment as opposed to water rushing in from the ocean. I can't show you the new erosion maps just yet because they're still being um, inspected by the Department of Environment and Science. Uh, this work was scheduled to be completed October last year, but um, the department felt that there were some things we needed to change about how we modelled erosion. So this is an example of what the end product will look like that BMT did for the um, city of Coffs Harbour. So, whoops, not that <clears throat> So what we're hoping to get to is a map that shows erosion at 2040, mid-century, and then end of century, where it could theoretically get to in a kind of um, worst case scenario during a one in 100 year event. And what we want to do is then use that information and look at what's inside those zones, what kind of assets are in there. Um, and then the end point is obviously, what do we do about that? Can we do anything? Do we need to change? Um, uh, planning systems, do we need to look at protection measures, do we need to accommodate, do we need to just accept the risk, um, all sorts of things. <clears throat> um, the other thing we've found is that in some locations where you have, we're expecting permanent inundation from sea level rise during the highest astronomical tide, uh, but also king tides, like you've just experienced, may get to a point where it's intolerable. Um, some places they're fine with being a little bit of water over the top of them once a year, or once every couple of years. But there might be certain locations that are so low lying that it just, it's permanently every day or once a month it's underwater. Uh, I don't mean over the roof, I just mean it might be an inch or a foot deep. So as I just alluded to, that the whole purpose of having those maps is to um, ask ourselves what now and what are the kind of assets that are in the coastal zone that we need to be concerned about. So this project is looking at both human and natural assets, um, so built environment, habitat areas, also not just tangible assets but also intangible assets, so cultural values placed on certain areas. So you might have a beach that we, know, we might reasonably expect to um, respond naturally and we might not have to do anything about it but something might change there that alters the way it, that particular location can be used and there might be such a value placed on that location that um, maybe we need to think about doing something about it. <clears throat> so these are just some examples, I'm not saying that they are specific ones we're looking at, but if you've ever spent time along the coast here, um, you may already be able to sitting here now in the crowd, think about certain things you, you know of that might be at risk in future. So we've got some obvious ones, um, like surf clubs, beach, foreshore parks, that kind of thing. Um, conservation areas might be at risk, um, private property, all sorts of things. So we need to just make sure that we're across which of, which of those are affected and which of those are the most important or of concern in terms of going right through the rest of the project in terms of developing, uh, conducting a risk analysis on them, uh, developing risk mitigation measures, 
doing a cost benefit analysis of, uh, analysis of those and then incorporating them into council's long term planning. So there are a number of filters we're using to try to work out what those important assets are. <clears throat> so we're looking at the difficulty to replace, um, the cost to replace, the scarcity across the shire. So difficulty to replace um, is something like, uh, let's say something is damaged and just the amount of effort to design and consult and build and all of that just to replace something, that's quite difficult as opposed to say, a toilet block is quite easy to replace. Um, also the cost, uh, the length of design life, again, things like toilet blocks or picnic tables have fairly short um, time spans. We are only designed with say a 10 or 15 year time span involved. But if you're building a hotel or a surf club or um, purchasing conservation land or land for conservation, you've got a 50 year, 100 year infinite timeline involved in mind. And so we need to take all of that into account in terms of how do we filter down of all the assets that are within the area to um, the ones that are um, worth doing a deeper dive on. So to give you an example, in the 2100 storm tide scenario, there are over 2,500 uh, locations within that area. So we need to figure out which ones we look at. <clears throat> uh, the erosion prone areas are mostly exposed on the open exposed coast, so there's a lot fewer assets to look at, um, but often they're of a different nature. So, the next phase we've gone through, sorry, I'm going a bit over time, <clears throat> is uh, on the risk assessment. So, understanding what these hazards mean for those particular assets and identifying <clears throat> excuse me, any particular hotspots where the risks might be so high that we really, really need to make sure we. Um, pick apart what's going on there. And so we're doing this process um, in accordance with the <coughs> sorry international standard on um, risk management. And so the actual risk process, assessment process is just here. And so that's what we're currently in the middle of now. Um, this particular process works well in terms of accommodating the uncertainty with climate change science, whether it's sea level rise, storm intensity, that kind of thing. Um, but what, what it give, gives you is a framework through which to move and get some answers at the end so that you've got a little bit more, you've got not a little bit more, you've got more confidence around um, the responses you'll, you'll come up with. <clears throat> Sorry for those who've seen something like this before, but that's the very basic overview how the risk assessment process works. So we look at the likelihood of an event occurring, the impact of that event, and then that gives us the risk level. I won't go into detail up there just because we're running out of time, but um, <clears throat> the process we're going to be looking at is not just physical damage to an asset, but we're also we're using a triple bottom line approach. Apologies for any of you who hate that phrase, um, but we are concerned with um, each asset looking, assessing what it might mean from a social, environmental, or, or a, uh, economic perspective. And it does differ. And we're not, um, they're all equally weighted. It's just we want to understand what the nature of the impact is. Uh, as I said earlier, we're doing a specific biodiversity <coughs> sorry, uh, impact assessment as part of this project. So one of the things uh, people have said is that uh, natural, uh, natural systems are naturally resilient and they have natural inbuilt adaptive capacity. However, we're not operating in a natural system. Uh, we're in a modified system, uh, both geographically speaking in terms of the amount of development and where it's gone on, but also um, climatologically speaking, we're in a, a modified system. So what we need to know with this particular project is what does climate change and coastal hazards mean, what might it mean for uh, natural assets here in Noosa? And what can we do to increase the odds of those natural systems um, remaining healthy and functional into the future? And so there are two questions that stem from this. Um, where and what do we need to do? Uh, so that might mean there is land now that has a low ecological value but strategically, it might be important to um, 
save that land for conservation purposes because there might be a system nearby that will naturally want to migrate there. So we need to stop that land being developed now so that the system can respond naturally. Um, equally, equally, we also need to know what um, shouldn't we focus our efforts on. There might be a particular piece of um, land that is in a natural state now, but uh, in future, uh, it may not be able to exist anywhere else just because other climate parameters um, don't allow it to, the temperature or the availability of fresh water. And so if we were to acquire that land now for conservation purposes, might that be a inefficient use of funding? It might not exist in four years. So there's a question of, is it worth spending that money to save that now if no matter what we do, it won't be able to survive yet? So, and the question of sitting across the top of both of those, and indeed the entire plan, is when do we do these actions? Um, and just, I just want to make it clear that Council certainly is not and cannot create this plan um, by its own. We need, in, we need to understand that to get the best environmental outcomes, we need to work in partnership with um, the various ecologically minded community groups out there, um, from those who are probably at the more strategically minded end of the spectrum and those who are the sort of boots on the ground, you know, doing actual plantings and weed control and stuff. Everybody needs to be involved um, because we can't go this particular piece of work alone. <coughs> Sorry, I can not stop doing that. Um, so this particular piece of work, what we're doing is looking at the impacts so far to broad vegetation groups um, as a result of coastal hazards, as well as a few key and iconic species that some of them are um, threatened or endangered. Others may be locally um, important, but not necessarily endangered or threatened on a broader um, nationwide scale. So to do that, uh, we need to first understand how resilient they are to the particular hazards. Um, what their adaptive capacity is. Not, they're not just their natural adaptive capacity, but also their current adaptive capacity. So, like I said earlier, if some development's gone on directly adjacent to a particular uh, habitat type that prevents that habitat migrating as it naturally would, then that means that habitat has a uh, diminished uh, adaptive capacity. Um, one thing that's been raised repeatedly throughout this project by people a lot more uh, qualified than I am is uh, what's going to happen with groundwater dependent ecosystems, particularly from a sea level rise perspective, um, due to saline intrusion, um, especially along the North Shore. And the short answer is unfortunately the QCoast project doesn't allow us to look at that just yet. Um, in fact, that's quite a, a new growing area of uh, environmental science trying to understand what might happen from an aquifer perspective. Um, so unfortunately the answer is we're not really sure. Um, we will try to look at it as much as we can, but that could be one of those things that um, time may be on our side that we can um, put in the basket to address once information becomes available or funding. The other piece we're trying to do as part of this project is how does <coughs> How do the climate change projections reconcile with Council's existing um, environmental management plans or indeed the plans that Ms. Parks and other groups may have? Um, like I said, if you're thinking about doing one thing and then this project turns around and says, actually, that might not be worth saving uh, or might not be, sorry, not worth, might not be possible to save, um, you, do you need to think about, and does Council need to think about plans it currently has in place? So to do this piece of work, we're using, uh, this is a standalone piece of work as opposed to the stuff that we've got engineers working on. So we're using an adapted um, risk assessment process pulled together by NCARF, where we're looking at the vulnerability of a environmental asset, the risk posed to that asset, and then we're trying to calculate what the future vulnerability of that, sorry, future vulnerability of that asset is. And then we throw a storm tide on top of that and figure out where the most at-risk areas are. Because today there might be some areas that could theoretically cope with um, saltwater inundation, but they might be in a weakened state in future due to prolonged drought or some other, some other reason. 
and so that they are they are they are more sensitive to uh, an event like a storm tide and so today they might not look at risk but in future they might be at risk and then from that try to create a priority list of where do we need to act um, either in terms of uh, immediate immediate need or in terms of where are the high priority areas that we will need to act in future but we need to start working on things now to make sure that we either have the funding and other resources to do that <clears throat> So this just illustrates uh, a little bit what I'm talking about. So this is for complex of open shrubland to closed shrubland, grassland, low woodland, and open forest on strand and on sand and four dunes. That makes sense to anybody. What this map is telling you is that from an atmospheric perspective, so temperature and rainfall, this particular vegetation group um, has this is uh, in the past, and you can consider that to be today. So these are the climate, system, climate parameters that this um, vegetation group could theoretically operate within and where in this whole area, so obviously Noosa is just here, um, where it might be existing. I'm not saying where it exists today, it's where it could theoretically exist. But as the, as the climate changes, what might happen to that, um, to that uh, theoretical uh, extent in future? So with this particular group, you can actually see that as the temperature warms up, this particular group could theoretically spread, as the but as the century goes on, it, start, it goes, goes like this, and then it starts to go the other way. It starts to get too hot, it's too little water. And this is this is a more drastic example. You can see that this particular group, I'm gonna read out the name, <clears throat> can exist in this area today, but by mid-century, um, the temperature and the rainfall availability might limit it to this area here. And then as the century goes on, this tiny little pocket down here, which I believe would put it somewhere along Pumastone Passage, um, is it. So this relates back to that question around what what can actually be saved, um, and where's where's the most effective um, uh, places we can spend our time and other resources. Oh, there it goes. It's just died. Did you turn it off because you want me to stop talking? No. Um. What's that? It's with the little So this work has been done by um, some consultants we've had on board called EcoShore. So that particular, those particular images are the outputs of a, pro a program called um, Maximum Maximum Extent. I believe it's been developed by the Herbarium. And so <clears throat> this is an example of what we're trying to get to at the end. Start to identify the high risk areas right down to the low risk areas. The idea being to create a risk register at the end that helps to guide the adaptation planning process. And then from that, there's the kind of questions we need to start asking ourselves. Like, where are there existing controls already that maybe they just require a little bit of modification or mean that we don't actually have to do anything for 10, 20, 50 years? Does the flood code effectively cover areas prone to flooding? Have we built Put the hazard risk into our asset maintenance program. So the road's been a good example. How aware is the community and other stakeholders of what the risks actually are? So, cut forward to today. This is where we're at at the moment. Um, the reason we're sort of in a holding pattern here is twofold. The department decided that we needed to uh, update some of our modeling. And at the same time, we got to a point where we thought, we, uh, as, as, as informed as the working group and all the other people involved in this project are, um, we need to go out and test some of this with the broader community to make sure that our assumptions are correct or where we might need to change things. So for the rest of this year, uh, we're going to complete the biodiversity work in the first quarter and start kicking off some of these engagement activities. Uh, we're going to provide that asset register, key asset register to the state. Um, we, in the second quarter, 
we will start working on what those adaptation responses might actually be, do the more detailed economic analysis, and then pull together the final technical report. And I just want to point out this thing here, this web tool. As part of this project, we're developing a separate um, uh, internet uh, web, web platform uh, mapping tool for this project. And so, because in the past, often when you go on to government websites to look at flooding material, or flooding maps, it's just a map, it's coloured, you can't interrogate it, you can zoom in and out, that's about it. It won't tell you how deep the water is, it won't tell you why a risk rating is what it is. So we're creating a, a separate system from Council's current systems that will allow you that level of detail to go in and interrogate, find specific assets, how deep is the water there, when is it going to happen, why was the risk rating, why is the risk rating what it is? Is it because it's highly impacted or it's going to be a frequent flooding event? And sitting in front of that will be a whole raft of uh, information to help people understand in a more concise way what I've been explaining today around climate science, how the hazards are developed, what they mean, how we do the modelling, how the whole process works. And then at the end of this year, um, we'll start working on the actual drafting of the adaptation plan and ideally submit the coastal hazards component to the state government and get their sign off. So phase six is when we do the adaptation planning um, part and we were able to benefit from some of the lessons learned from elsewhere around good planning responses and maybe not so great planning responses. Uh, the example everybody likes to throw up is Byron Shire Council and um, some of the sticky problems you might be able to run into. But I'm conscious of time so I'll fly through the next few. The science and the mapping won't give us the definitive answer. What it provides is an information basis through which to start having the adaptation discussion. Um, and and that's, what ha that's what phase six is all about. And that's actually where a lot of um, the workshops with the community are going to be. And it's where we, we can't really do that without, it's not something that can happen in-house at council. Um, because some of the adaptation responses will be quite um, uh, conflicting depending on your point of view. For instance, someone might want to have a whole bunch of money spent protecting one asset, but the rest of the community has to pay for that protection measure, vice versa. You might have someone saying, let this area go, and everyone else in a small group or a large group saying, no, we need to do something about that. So that's going to be quite an involved discussion when we get there. <clears throat> and the other thing we need to work through is what might work for the Gold Coast or somewhere else might not necessarily work for Noosa. Uh, and part of that is also understanding where we've already modified the landscape and put in protection measures, um, whether we agree with them or not. <laughs> and I won't go through that. Um, this is just a quick, frank, um, quick, quick infographic of the framework through which we adaptation planning happens. So you've got where existing development already occurs. So the question is, do we protect something? Do we modify it so that it can respond to or deal with the hazard when it comes? Or do we actually have to abandon a particular area and say we won't let any future development happen there eventually it'll get to a point where that's it forget about it where there has been no development yet um, and this is where the planning scheme plays a huge role is where are areas where we don't want to intensify the kind of development that's already there let's say there's a park there or some houses in the future someone might want to come along and say that would be a great spot for a resort one thing that might happen is Sorry, you can't do that because the state prevents us from doing that and it's, uh, it's wouldn't, council wouldn't be upholding its duty of care. Uh, and there's a few others there as well. So the socioeconomic uh, part, I won't go into the detail there, but suffice to say we get to a short list of adaptation responses and then they have to go through a detailed cost-benefit analysis. And then we take all that and we start putting it into an adaptation plan. And so the key takeaway from this is what we develop called adaptation pathways. So we map out for each asset its risks all the way to 2100. And because some of the hazards might not become a problem for 20 years, 50 years, or even right towards the end of the century. So we just map it out in a nice, easy to, way, easy to understand roadmap that says at this point, this hazard will become too hard to ignore, so you need to do this. At this point, do this. Or, or at this point, if this hazard starts to happen, do nothing, just keep monitoring and then change as you go along. So it's a really iterative document. I'll go back. That's just the levels. Levels. Okay, that's too much detail. So, 
Um, I should have started with this because it's the main reason I'm here. Um, ooh, sorry. Over the next few months, um, we've contracted a uh, planning and engagement firm to assist us with capturing some really important information from the community that will help inform the technical report. And then after that, we also have got a whole engagement phase around the actual adaptation plan itself. Um, so what we need help is help on is identifying or validating our assumptions on where those key important assets are to the community. Um, some you might not think are important, but council deems important from an infrastructure point of view and vice versa. But we just need to get everybody's input so that we are confident in the list that we move forward with. On top of that, uh, in phase five, we need some more information around your tolerance and the community's tolerance for the actual hazards themselves. Um, somewhere, say, Rockhampton, where they get floods all the time, they're used to it. A metre, nothing to them, depending on where you live. But somewhere like Brisbane, everybody loses their mind if there's a metre of water in the street for a day. So the tolerances differ by community and differ within the community. So that piece of work is to understand what the, what the lay of the land is like across the community in terms of those hazard tolerances. The part that comes after that is, once we start working through how do we respond to those risks, that's the adaptation conversation. That's where we'll come to the community and say, here's a hundred different things we could do. Which of these are you comfortable with? Which of these are you happy to pay for? Do you not want to pay for? Should we do a hideous a damage into the environment? That whole, that whole conversation. So it's quite an involved thing. And um, as other councils have experienced, uh, can end up with some conflict out the community. So. But we need to have that conversation. Uh, and then the final phase, phase eight, is around mid-year, around uh, July, August, um, the first draft or early draft of that adaptation plan will go out for comment for, uh, I think it's a month. So that's where you'll be able to see how the input you provided all the way along is coming through in that actual adaptation plan and where uh, we might need to change some things there. And that's, sorry. Mm -hmm. for that uh, wow, very detailed look at a very complex topic. Uh, we're going to have time for questions. I know we are running a little bit behind schedule, but uh, if you've got a good question, please uh, address, wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you, Grant. Uh, uh, very laudable work on your part, i.e. Council's part, but uh, uh, backbone. Uh, are there any uh, federal or state legislative uh, constraints or indeed uh, penalties against developers and planners like councils mm -hmm. to, to constrain them with the sort of developments they do. I mean, in other words, is there backbone behind all this thing? Something able to be done across the state and the country? Yeah. Um, well, I can't speak for across the country, but in Queensland, that's where the state planning policy oh, it is, um, comes into play. So when the planning scheme goes up for the minister's review in the next couple of months, um, one of the things they're going to look quite closely at is how have these natural hazards been taken into account. Um, there's no penalties from the state per se for local government. Um, but there's the very real risk of uh, litigation. So this is why I had that slide up there around risks to council and right up the top was legal liability. Um, no council, uh, as we've seen with Fire and Shire Council, wants to be in a position where it's um, either not provided information or it's um, given approval for development or it's in its planning scheme uh, indicated that something is okay to happen in an area when it knew that maybe that was not the most prudent thing to do. So from this council's perspective, that's what um, Tony and, and the rest of the councils are particularly cognizant of, is their duty of care, not just to future councils in terms of um, the legacy they leave behind, or a positive legacy they leave behind, but also 
any negative legacy that we buy. But I want to um, put those councils and indeed the community um, from the council uh, in that position. So it's something that um, we're particularly cognizant of. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, yes, except that uh, there are plenty of examples over the last two or three decades of all sorts of terrible developments on yep. flat plains and in the well places behind sand dunes during winter degradation, yep. anywhere between here and Sydney. Yep. All done in recent times yep. without any sort of restraint on the fall of the planet. When we had um, the QCRC people come in. The main thing we wanted them to talk about was the legal side. So we had a group of lawyers there giving council just a quick overview of um, the things it needs to be aware of. And so in the past, um, the courts uh, may not have been as strong on council. Um, let, let's say, for example, something happens to an asset that was built 20 years ago. The Informal advice we've had is that the courts may not be come down so hard on councils for approving that development because, in their eyes, there may have been uncertainty around where the climate science was at. The uh, the way it was expressed to us last year was that that's no longer an excuse. So the courts are based on the balance of evidence. And scientific evidence, I believe, is now at 98% confidence level. So the courts uh, exist at 51%, so there's no excuse now. So, yeah, we are very aware of that. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, a couple, couple of things. The insurance companies love your risk management maps because they're using them to um, raise the premiums on household insurance. Mm. Whilst councils say they were meant for insurance companies, nevertheless, it's happening because they're not detailed enough. There have been cases where people are living on uh, raised land, but the council shows mm. that whole area, yeah. and so premiums skyrocket. Mm. The other thing is that um, our government doesn't seem to have a population plan, and the, the number of people that's uh, arriving in Australia per week is at record levels. Mm. It stimulates the economy, they sell more houses, more appliances, but they all want to live on the coast. So, where do we go? Mm. Uh, well, I won't talk to population issues. Um, Noosa is a, a good example of where at least some attempt has been made to um, not uh, stick with the um, status quo on the approach to population. Uh, but in terms of the insurance um, question, part of your question, uh, my understanding is that this council has been under pressure, as many other councils have, from the Insurance Council of Australia to release um, all of its mapping to the insurance sector. Um, in terms of how they respond to that mapping, I mean, that's beyond our control. One of the things that we are looking to potentially do this year, over the next year, is go out and do more detailed surveying at the lot scale. So rather than an entire lot showing up on a map of being within a flood, potential flood area, we want to see if we can take into account floor levels, the topography on the lot scale, so that we can even refine those, refine those flood, flood potential areas even further um, to help get around some of the uh, inaccuracies that, um, or conclusions that the insurance sector may draw, and indeed landowners as well. So. I think as we go forward in terms of climate change, we're going to expect more and more increases in insurance premiums because things like storms, cyclones, extreme things will have all sorts of ramifications and not surprisingly, it's going to cost us all money. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, um, a lot of people might think they're covered for things that they're not covered for, and that's like I said, the insurance sector's been in this space for 15 years now, um, and they're not about to uh, cover you for things that you hope to be covered for. <laughs> Doesn't stop them putting the premiums up there. Yes, sorry. Um, thanks, Grant. My name's Kerry, and I'm currently putting together the 
Biosphere Reserve um, periodic review for Noosa to go to UNESCO <laughs> in um, end of September this year. So um, that's a really um, fantastic outline of the work that's going on around climate change adaptation in Noosa, which I can hopefully put into this report. Um, one question I have though is it seems to me that a place like Noosa is very heavily um, dependent upon a tourism industry mm -hmm. and that a lot of the climate change risks and hazards that you've outlined today will impact on the tourism sector mm -hmm. and indeed the agricultural sector in the hinterland. So what plans has Council got to um, approach it from a more integrated way and mm -hmm. you know get those business organisations working together now with Council um, so that everyone's in step in the sense of um, planning for what inevitably will be coming our way in the next 20, 30 years or more. Um, secondly, what do you think we can do as residents of Noosa right now to um, get involved in the process and talk to our local MPs about it, local media, Yep. Um, because what I'm picking up at the moment is in the media there's not too much attention being paid to um, some of the extraordinary things that we're um, experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I was down in Tasmania two weeks ago and it was 35 degrees in Hobart um, and no one seems to be saying, hey, this is really unusual, you know, what can we do about this. It's just, oh, we've got a big uh, week long of hot weather coming our way, you know, get get prepared. So what can we do as residents, as ratepayers, as landholders, um, you know, to work in our own personal sphere? Mm -hmm. um, on the first part of that question, on um, tourism and agriculture, I unfortunately have to fly past it, but <clears throat> this year is when we're looking at what um, climate change might mean from a non-coastal hazard perspective, so drought, extreme heat days, flooding, that kind of thing. Um, the state's uh, adaptation strategy is on a is structured in a sector-based kind of way, so specifically agriculture, human health, built environment, tourism. Um, we are trying to align that broader piece of work with where the state is going to send their piece of work. Um, in terms of that, also just makes it easier. Council ever has to put anything up for the count for the state to review it. Also, if there's any, if there's more money on the table, which I know there's some coming up, and I'm already positioning myself to put in an application to get that funding. Um, we want to be able to be able to get that funding um, if we can. We, in terms of uh, engaging those local sectors, uh, Tourism Nusa has been involved in the coastal hazards work we've been doing. Um, there's a bit of a education uh, mountain to climb with some sectors of the community in terms of getting them to appreciate the risks to them. Um, the agricultural community is a bit of a mix, depends on where someone's come from, what which agricultural enterprise they're involved in. Um, but through that piece of work, we are um, it's looking like we'll need to set up specific sector-based working groups for Noosa to deal with that. So one just for tourism and the economy, um, one for the agricultural sector up in the hinterland. So um, I've already been engaging with the Karoi Chamber of Commerce. They're, they're happy to get behind this project and they want um, to understand more about what climate change means for their stakeholders and the hinterland more broadly. Um, like I said, my folks live out in Kinkin, they have a farm. So my dad is always texting me saying, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? Um, yeah, so there, there, is, there is more stuff coming. Unfortunately, like I said, we don't have funding for that right now. So we'll be looking to see what are the most pressing issues we need to get stuck into now. Uh, where can we get funding if it does become available? And where can we partner with, say, um, another lead agency like DAF, um, Department of Agriculture, who is, has been doing some work in this for a couple of years, oh, that seems to be a little bit up and down. Um, and on that note, there might be some issues that are, is beyond this council and or any local government to deal with. Um, 
things like um, southward migration of tropical diseases or harmful marine species. Not a lot we can do about to stem that tide. Um, so this, this the broader project is trying to figure out what can council do, who can we partner with, and what's important to us. So, um, in terms of engagement, yeah, I would say just don't let up to your elected representatives. I'm sure many of you do that already. Um, right into the paper, and I think in terms of why is that conversation not being had in a more open way around climate change? Um, I think because it tends to get still get bogged down in climate science and whether it's real and is it humans and that kind of thing. And the conversation, um, one way of framing it is, as you said, as you hinted at, um, to write to the paper and point out this is not normal. This is not, we do, Australia is the land of flood and drought, but they're happening more frequently and they're happening to a, to a more severe extent and all these things. And that's what I don't think the general population is quite clicked into is that the change is already happening and it's going to get worse. Um, I would encourage you to start writing into the local paper. I'm aware that there's people that write in on the opposite side of the equation. Yeah, but when survey after survey shows that Noosa, just like everywhere else, the support behind, but behind um, that humans are the cause of climate change, or this current bout of climate change, um, and that we need to do something about it, sits around that 75 to 85% regardless of where you go. And so most of us are behind it, but you don't hear that overwhelming um, voice. So I would encourage you to um, be more vocal, particularly in the paper, um, so that as I think as more people see that everyone else is on board with it, they start to um, chime in as well. And in terms of this particular project, uh, we're still waiting on final sign-off from the department on our erosion maps, but as soon as we get that, it's all systems go, and we'll have um, several pop-ups around the Shire um, workshops uh, later in the year. The mapping tool will be available. There'll be surveys. You'll be able to contribute that way. Come along in person. We'll be having some information sessions at council from time to time. There's a lot coming. Um, just not quite yet. Okay. Well, I think. Um there's a long way to go, but you've come a long way already. So in a year, you've done pretty well. <laughs> we'll come back and we'll give you a report card again yeah. <laughs> another time. It is, uh, it is a, well, without a doubt, the biggest threat that Australia faces. And I do believe our Department of Defence has, in fact, put that as the number one strategic issue. Climate change is the biggest threat to this country from a defence point of view, mm -hmm. um, among other points of view. But it isn't, um, you mentioned the US Department of Defence, but Australia is a little bit along that way. I don't think the government has unfortunately read that paper yet. <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're, ho we're hopeful, we're always hopeful. I just wonder why we need 12 submarines and why we need help with climate change. Mm, that'll be really helpful. I was thinking that very thought when Grant was speaking. I thought, I wonder what they'll be used for. We could perhaps have Noah's Ark on a submarine. Okay. Um, <laughs> on that happy. Sorry? In China. We get 12 made in China for the same For price. half the price. <laughs> thank you, Isabel. All right. Well, I'd just like to say thank you to Grant because I realise it's uh, quite daunting. Presenting a year's work in an hour, yeah. but um, you've done soon. very well. So thank you very much, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, oh. just, just one more break. So, uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate it enormously. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you very much. I do hope you'll come back again when there's uh, there's some more updates because uh, we really everyone is quite keen to see what's going to happen mm -hmm. and uh, looking forward to it very much. Thanks so, for having me. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being kind. See you next week. Don't forget it's Bird Observers Day with uh, Greg speaking about pelagic seabirds next week. So that should be a fabulous morning. Thank you very much and uh, please come back again.